This week I've been doing exactly what I encouraged all of you to do. I went and got uh, a little planner, a little notepad, went to the presence of God and just started listening. You know, when, when you do that, heaven has a lot to say. God is speaking right now. The king is in his field. That's a part of the days of awe. And the Spirit of God began to speak to me about the goal. You know, if, if you're on a football team, you've got to know where the goal is. If you don't, you can get mixed up and run the other way, and the last thing you want to do is score for the other team. We have got to keep our eye on the goal. And where I want to go this morning is Romans chapter 10. And I want to read, first of all, Romans uh, 10, 1 through 13. We're actually going to be examining a lot of Scripture this morning, and I'm also going to deal with a couple of elephants in the room that when you begin dealing with this, if you don't understand the Apostle Paul and you read it from a Gentile uh, uh, 21st century church modality, you can actually misunderstand what the Apostle Paul is saying. I want to start here with verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. How many know that is still the prayer of Paul today? That is the, the attitude toward heaven. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now that is the elephant in the room that we're going to come back and deal with here just in a moment. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, which is the word of faith which we preach." That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever shall call upon the... Uh, uh, go by, <laughs> I've just jumped. And the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be a saint, for there is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. For the same Lord is rich over all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, one of the things that we love to do in modern churchianity is to take one verse, take it out of context, and interpret it outside of scripture. We do that all the time. I mean, we've dealt with a lot of them here. Like, be ye not unequally yoked has nothing to do with marriage. It has to do with the association of paganism. Now, that can be interpreted, thou shalt not marry a pagan bride. I mean, that's a good thing. But yet, we, we, sometimes we miss exactly what is being said here. And so, I, God kept on talking to me about the goal, and he kept taking me back to Romans 10 and 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And the way everybody interprets that is, thanks to Jesus, the law has been ended. And you miss completely what is being said here. The, the Greek word here for end is telos. And it comes from the primary word, or telo, which means to set out for a, a definite point or goal, properly the point aimed as a limit by implication, a conclusion of an act or state termination, literally, figuratively, and definitively, result, immediate, ultimate, prophetic purpose, specifically, and impost or levy or tax being paid. And so that word can mean a lot of things, can it? And the way that you, a lot of times, you, you can't just go by the definition. You have to look back in the context in which it was said. Just like today with our vernacular. You know, it used to be when you said, that dude is bad, that was a bad thing. Now it can mean he's cool. You have to go back and look at the context of what is being said there to understand. Now, all of this in Romans 10 is dealing with salvation, entering into salvation. 
Now, what, what, I, what I have done is I've done some research, and I want to read a couple of things from Dr. Stern's Jewish New Testament commentary. I love the man's honesty. He gets it. Now it says, according to Arnott and Gingrich's a Greek, a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament, the Greek word telos, used 42 times in the New Testament, has to, has to mean finish, cessation, termination in four or five places. And so everybody wants to say, well, that right here, right? The law has been done away with. But he goes on to say, but in a great majority of cases, it means either an aim purpose or goal toward which the movement is being directed or outcome, result, consummation, last part of a process not obviously being directed, uh, but which may or may not terminate above. These meanings are reflected in the English word uh, teleology, the branch of philosophy dealing with goals or purposes. Okay. So what, really what he's talking about, and he goes on to describe that part of our problem is our theology has gotten in the way of our exegesis. That in the context of this, this word should be translated, Jesus is the aim of the Torah. Jesus is the goal of the Torah. But the theology that we have inherited from the Catholic Church says that Jesus is the end of the Torah. Even though in the context of all these things that cannot be extrapolated out and made sense of, we take that one verse, and I've had people give me proof tense that God's commandments have been done away with because Jesus did away with them. Then Jesus is a liar. He said, thank not that I have come to destroy the law. I've not come to set it aside. So which one is right, Jesus or the Apostle Paul? Or have we misunderstood the Apostle Paul? Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the goal. So in everything that we do, Jesus is the bullseye that we're supposed to hit. In fact, I think by him using that definition, he actually plays on the word Torah. Because Torah, in its root, it, it talks about drawing a, an arrow, putting it in a bow, and drawing it back, and being able to hit the bullseye. It can be translated hitting the mark. It can also be translated the instruction of a loving father into his son. Why? So that he can hit the mark. And so in, from, from a Hebraic point of view, he, he is word playing here. He is saying Jesus is the, the, the goal. He is the aim that we were aiming with with the Torah. And that righteousness which was supposed to come when you hit the mark is spelt Jesus. Now, why is that so important? Because everything that we do is about Jesus. The moment Jesus is not the goal, you've left God. Now, let me, I'm gonna, I want to show you a couple things. Now, all these things are very precious to me. The first one is a talit. This is one of the many talitot that I have. And I have seen guys do very goobery things with this. How many know that this thing is, is something holy? And the reason it's holy is because it represents Jesus from beginning to end. Notice the stripes on it. And so when a man takes a talit and he puts it on like this, the Apostle Paul said to put on Christ. I've got to put off the old man and every time I go into prayer I am putting on the new man. And by his stripes, I am healed. I, every time I go into my prayer closet and I put on my talit to pray, I am reminded with a visible representation that his stripes bought my healing. That's one of the reasons why in Malachi it said that he could raise with healing in his wings in the zitzi because those zitzi are connected to the stripes one day that he would bear. 
This is also my prayer closet. When I go in to pray to tabernacle with him, I am reminded that I have become the Mishkan of the Holy Ghost. I am now the temple of God. And right here is where the throne of God is supposed to dwell. And Messiah is supposed to be sitting on that throne. Let Christ dwell in your hearts richly. When I look at the Zitzi, right here, the number of knots and the number of threads combined equals 613, all the commandments of God. That as I look at this, I'm reminded that I am to walk in the commandments of God because the commandments are of the kingdom that this talit represents. The number of the knots spell yod He vav He, the sacred name of God. But what brings it all together? What makes this a true zitzi is the tachalet, the blue cord. You see... It's all about Jesus. Jesus is interweaved into all of it. I can't do the commandments without him. I cannot honor Father God without Jesus. So as I, as I put this on in the, and when I, when I pray, I am reminded I have got to be intertwined with Messiah. It's got to be to the place. You can't really tell in this where Messiah ends and the commandments start. You can't really tell it. It's all one piece. So it needs to be with my life. It's all about Jesus. It's not about parading around trying to feel special. It is a, it is a physical reminder, something that you can touch. How many know most of us, especially us guys, we, we've got to be able to touch something. We've got to be able to, to put our hands on something to be able to really get it across to us because we are a little dense, okay? okay. I, I can say this as a guy. We're a little dense, uh, but the moment that we can actually put our hands on it, you know why? Women are human beings. They, they can just be. Men were created to be doers, we're human doings. Until we can grab, grab it, grab onto it, we have a hard time conceptualizing it. And that's why God gave us so many things that we could, we could see and we could touch them and we could say, I get it. I get it. I see, when, whenever I look at a talit, I don't, I don't see something fancy and Jewish just so that, because that, what I see is people parading around in it trying to feel special. And guys, I've been to some conferences where they start comparing the quality and the workmanship. And how I many know oh, there there are talit uh, that you can get that are two, three, four, five thousand dollars, and all this. And and then you have some that have no blue cord. That's not a zitzi. You can't have it without Messiah. The, the image has been lost. And I, I think it's interesting that after the destruction of the temple, all things that went on, the Jewish people forgot how to make that blue dye. But it wasn't until the Jewish people began to have the Messianic movement begin to take hold. Now, they, they really don't want to admit this, but it wasn't until Jews began discovering who Messiah was that some of them got together and prayed, and they were biochemists, and they figured out it came from this snail in the Mediterranean, and they began to get the blue cord back. Why? Because for a long time, they had the commandments without Messiah. Now they do. We look at the, the shofar. Do you know why it's a ram's horn? Because that's what they blew back then, Brother Mike. <laughs> this one day, one of them grabbed it by the horn and said, come here, I need something to toot. No, that is, that, is, that is not what it's about. There was something. Abraham went up into the mountain, and he said, God will provide the lamb. And he was getting ready to go up and, and offer up Isaac. And something got hooked up in the thorn bush by its what? By its horn. And so every time that we blow this, in fact, there's a, a special way you can blow it that sounds like a cry. It's a cry for the promise of the Lamb of Abraham. That God said, Abraham said God would provide a lamb. Well, that day he provided a ram, but it's a reminder, a lamb's coming. And one day there was a prophet of God named John the Baptist who was on, on, he was on the side of the River Jordan, and all of a sudden he said, behold, Right there, that guy right there. There's God's lamb. 
And so it was a cry for God's lamb. Now, post-Calvary, it's not a cry for God's lamb. It is announcing the victory of the lamb of God. And it is here for us to be able to understand that we need to learn how to hear what heaven is doing. It, it's a call. This thing is used for two things, biblically. It is a call for God's people for war. The watchman on the wall when he saw the enemy coming. So it's a call of alert to draw God's people to war. It's also for the meet for time together. It wasn't war, but it's a different sound of time together because it's time for us to worship or come together for something. And yet we're having people use it for a lot of other things. It's not that. There's something on the inside of those who walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you hear the ze- when you hear the, the 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 shofar sounded under the anointing of God, it spurs a reaction in you. Now we've made it. You know, it's supposed to stir a reaction in the spirit realm. It's supposed to drive off demons. No, it doesn't. What drives off demons is a believer standing in their authority in Messiah. Otherwise, the Apostle Paul would have given shofar classes <laughs> in the New Testament. He never did that. He said, it isn't at the sounding of the shofar that every knee shall bow. It's at the name of Jesus. And how many know there's a day coming? Now, we just celebrated the Feast of Trumpets, the day of the sounding of the shofar. And the very last toot, if you will, that they do on that day is called the last trump. There's a whole many different sounds that they give, and then there's the last trump. And the Apostle Paul says, at that last trump, that last sound is a call to a marriage feast. Do you believe in the rapture? Absolutely. Where I may disagree with most, I don't think it's going to happen at the beginning of the tribulation period. I think from what I see from Scripture, it's going to happen toward the end. And right before the Valley of Armageddon, we're going to be called away for the marriage feast of the Lamb 10 days before the Valley of Armageddon or the Day of Atonement. And we're going to go from the days of all to make sure I'm right with God. We're going to be walking around heaven with our mouths open going, oh, I couldn't believe it was this wonderful. I couldn't believe it was this awesome. I, I, I had kind of an idea, but Father, you have just blown me away. I couldn't imagine your power and your majesty and the wonders and the banquet that you have placed before us. I'm in absolute awe. And 10 days is exactly how long a Jewish wedding ceremony lasts. It represents the call of the bride. So when you see a shofar, you see Jesus, don't you? You see Jesus. Menorah. Now I've heard, you know, I, I, Brother Mike, I don't like that seven one menorah. I, I went ahead and got me with one of the big boys. I got me one of the nine sticks. <laughs> that's not called a menorah. That's called a Hanukkah. The menorah was given by God. The Hanukkah was not. In fact, I have talked to several rabbis that have done extensive research, and I love their truthfulness. They said we had, some, we had several very entrepreneurial Jewish people that wanted to come up with a way of celebrating the story of Hanukkah. So they created the Hanukkah for that sole purpose, and, and there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's something man-made to remember what God did. This one was given by God. This is the one that stood in the holy place. Because it's all about Jesus. That when the apostle uh, John saw Jesus in the Isle of Patmos, he was standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. I look at this and I see the plan of salvation for God, the spring feast. Jesus has fulfilled the spring feast. He is that Passover lamb. And the only way to get through the second half is to make sure that the blood is over the doorpost before you get there. 
Right now he is in the midst of the golden candlestick, Shavuot, that we are supposed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness in the earth. And what we're getting ready to see is that the, Jesus becomes the fulfillment of the fall feast. He is that king who sounds the trumpet, who gathers his bride. He is the one who makes announcements. He is the one on the day of atonement that he will go into the valley of Armageddon and he will kosher this planet because they refuse to humble themselves before Almighty God. And then he's coming back to tabernacle with us for a thousand years. I see Jesus. Say, Brother Mike, why, why, why are you getting into this? Because there's implications to the concept of Jesus being the goal of Torah. Implications. Grave implications. And I, I begin asking myself questions. Do you ever do that? Now, when you're, when you're communing with God, you can ask questions because he'll give you the answers. If I ask myself questions, what I come up with are more questions. And so I begin, God, what, 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 what does this really mean? And this is, because how many have seen a good part of the, the Gentile church that is just turned into Daffy Duck? They, they, they have lost their way. They have, they, have, they have done a lot of things. And this is some of the things that as I was meditating, God, God said, is it a possibility? Is, is, it a, is it possible to find the goal of Messiah without the preaching of the Torah? If... Jesus is the goal of the Torah. If you're not taught the commandments of God, if you're not taught what sin is and that we have a holy God and that he demands these things and that he is the creator, can it lead you to Messiah without that? Was Origen right? Origen was one of what they call the apostolic fathers. He was well beyond, how I many know, the apostolic fathers. He was in the Antonician period. And one day he was, he was declared a heretic. The next day he was declared a hero. And it kind of went back and forth his whole life. And what we have found out with Origen is in, in his... Um, uh, enclave that he had, his school in Alexandria, they have found a Mithra cave adjacent to his property. He was a Mithra worshiper in secret. This is one of the things he said. He said, God gave the Torah to lead the Judah Messiah, but he gave Greek philosophy to lead the Gentile. So that means Socrates and <laughs> Plato and Pluto and Goofy and <laughs> Mickey and Minnie, all of them were anointed of God to bring you to Messiah. How ridiculous is that? But here's the serious question. If we are coming to Messiah through another avenue besides the Torah, has it opened the door to lead us to another Jesus? Because, I mean, the, the way that people preach, I mean, a lot of people are serving a pork eating. Sabbath hating. I'll do what I want when I want Jesus. Is that really being led to Christ? We have, we have people that are, oh, sin's okay. God's got all that taken care of. You don't have to feel bad about your sin. But come on up here and, and say this 30-second prayer. Then you can join our club, and we'll give you your, your Willy Wonka golden ticket so that you can be buried with it so that when you get to heaven, Peter will be sitting at the gate. He's going to punch that ticket for you, brother. No, he's not. That's another Jesus. That's why Jesus said in the last days, many will come in my name and really say that I am the Christ. They'll say Jesus is the Messiah. They're just leading you to another one, one made in an image that is devoid of the Torah. So then you're being introduced, really, to Apollos. I mean, we even called his Apollos' birthday the birthday of Jesus. Apollos was born on December 25th. On the back of your $1 bill, where it says announcing the New World Order is taken from the, the Kumain Sibyl and her prophecy of the return of Apollos. And if you end up accepting a Jesus that is devoid of the Torah? Are you actually accepting a new Christianized version of Apollos to prepare you for his coming? These are questions we've got to ask ourselves. 
Because Jesus is the goal of the Torah. Jesus, the Torah was a pedagogy to lead us to Messiah. And nowhere in the Word of God does God ever say that there was another teacher, that there was another pedagogy other than the Torah to lead us to Messiah. And the last thing I want is to accept a Romanized Jesus because it's all connected to Rome. In fact, if we could go into the Vatican this morning, I could take you into that. They have a huge uh, fresco painted on the ceiling that has all the prophets. There's one woman stuck up in the midst of Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah, the Kumain Sibyl, the Apollyonic prophetess that uttered the words, hailing the coming or the return of Apollos in the last days. Kind of really gives us an idea of what they worship, what they're looking for. See, this is one of the reasons, and how many, how many know I'm spirit-filled? I'm spirit-filled. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the blood of Jesus. I, I believe all these things, but yet when I, when I have seen this crazy stuff going on, because it, 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 it's straying from Holy Writ. In the charismatic movement that years ago, I had to begin distancing myself from the charismatic movement because it was very obvious that they have begun following something other than the Word of God. And the quickest one to get the most squirrely is the prophetic movement. Well, you have that, and you have the almost a success-oriented movement. They're, they're giving you, they're giving you cycle babble and calling it gospel. And then we have a lot of the prophetic movement that is either doing new agey prophetic stuff, calling it the Holy Spirit, or they're they're getting into Kabbalah because now now that Hebraic heritage is very popular, they're pulling from mysticism, and I can go back into the very origin of Kabbalah that it originated with a rabbi who set up as Simon Bar Kochba as the Messiah before the destruction of Jerusalem the second time. Kabbalah originated with him because he rejected Messiah and he reached up into the mystical things that they had learned in Babylon and gave it a Jewish flavor. And so they'll sprinkle that in. Oh, Aren't I mis mysterious? Yeah, so were the prophets of Baal. I'm not impressed. Jesus is the goal. Jesus is the goal. Well, how about with the modern-day messianic movement? I mean, oh, there are parts of it that are right on. I mean, right, right, right on. But there are parts of it that are really, really off. Part of the reason... We find in Romans, two, uh, Romans 10, 2 and 3, I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, not according to the knowledge that Messiah was the goal. That's that. They have a zeal for the things of God, but they, they missed Messiah. And we need to understand that modern rabbinics is no more the way it was in the time of Jesus than the man on the moon. Nothing like it. One of the things that I have talked with experts that I really respect, like Ariel Berkowitz and others, that said, if you're going to study rabbinical writings, it needs to be the first century or before. Why? Because after the first century, the ones that were not a part of the Messianic movement rejected the goal. And so what we have, and, and, and uh, guys, I mean, there's a lot of the writings I like. I, I have read the, the Babylonian Talmud from beginning to end. Some of it I really like. I mean, some of, some of the, the, the things are profound, deep, deep thinkers that love God. And some of them are just like, <laughs> I, I don't understand. I've got some favorites like Rabbi Hirsch's, uh, the uh, Pentateuch and the Haftorah for being a Hamash. I, I love studying it. I love the study notes. But then, with a lot of them, I found myself getting frustrated. What do you mean, Brother Mike? I, there was a whole set, I think I got like either 16 or 24 of them, a daily dose of Torah. Now, from my point of view, that means getting into Moses, doesn't it? 
getting into Moses. I couldn't find Moses because this actually was a daily dose of oral Torah. <laughs> and I don't need and, and one entire volume, guys, one volume. I think the whole thing, because after about two-thirds of it, I got bored and set it down, was according to the rabbis, you, you can't do any type of commerce on the Sabbath. And so if, if money, by, by rabbinical definition, if you have money inside your house, and if you stick it outside the window and hand it to somebody, that's commerce, even though you're not buying anything. And so if the poor come to your door, you cannot give him money without violating the traditions of men. And so I went page after page after page after page after page to the place I was sinking below my desk of them trying to figure out a way that you could hand the guy the money without violating the rules of Sabbath. I went, I say. <laughs> what is going on here? And I, I, I began to seek God about what was going on. And he said, to a certain degree, uh, there is a prophetic type and shadow of what has gone on with the Jewish people. Remember there was a time Moses said, it's time for you to go over and to fight. There's the promise of going into the land. They walked up to the Jordan, and they said, uh-uh. They walked up to Messiah, and they said, uh-uh. And a lot of what has frustrated me was theologically, if Messiah is not the goal. You see, you cross over and you step into the goal. And if you don't step into the goal, you go back over and all you do is wander and wander and wander and wander and you never really get there. And you wander and you wander and you wander. And then, and it's no longer even wandering through Moses, it's wandering through centuries of guys wandering. Which, why it was frustrating to me is because I stepped on a cross. I got the goal. And it's easy. If I had a million dollars cash in my house, and the Holy Spirit said, go help this poor person on the Sabbath, I could load up the back of my pickup with all that money and I could drive it to somebody in need and I could give to the poor because I have found the rest that I was supposed to get in Messiah on the Sabbath. And that represents the goal. There are those all excited about light-activated light switches or voice-activated light switches so that you don't have to kindle fire or to, or to have a Sabbath oven that you can set it ahead of time so that it turns itself on. I want you to go back 4,000 years. I want you, you, you can't have a flint. You can't have like in the army, you have the thing, you scrape a rock on and sparks shoot all over the place. You can't get dryer lint, you know, be a good boy scout and get dryer lint to start. I want you to go out there with a stick and try to start a fire. Son, that is W-O-R-K. It's going to take you a long, long time. If you're like me, without kerosene and a bick, it may take you all day. It was hard work kindling fire back then. I mean, even if you do it the Boy Scout way where you make a pole and you get a string and you wrap it, you're sitting there with that thing. There have been Boy Scouts that have almost have died of old age trying to get it done. And then you wonder why God says, don't kindle fire on the Sabbath. Build the fire beforehand and keep it stoked. Yeah. Why? Because you don't want to spend your whole day trying to build a fire when you could be worshiping God. It didn't mean pushing an elevator button. It had nothing to do with a light switch. It had nothing to do with setting your oven. How many know it? Guys, I can even set the oven. Beep, beep, beep. Didn't break a sweat. <laughs> Took me 2.3 seconds. And then my dinner can be warming as we're talking about the things of God. But you, you see, we, we, we ha we're having 
there, there's two things going on with this that I have seen. I have seen Gentiles that never really had Messiah. They never really had the goal. And they, they, you see, our, our need to feel special was placed in us by God so that I could come to Messiah and feel special because I'm his beloved. He died for me. And he wants to fellowship with me. He wants to know me, and he wants me to know him. In Christ, I'm special. I don't need anybody else to make me feel special. The Apostle Paul said this way, if God be for you, who can be against you? They can line up and try. But really, when, when it's all said and done, God stands up for those that are his. And what I have found is because people are not in Christ, they, they, they try to feel special. Oh, yeah, Mike, you know, some guys are walking around with one of these little ones. Oh, yeah, well, I've really found God. <laughs> or some of them pull out the Yemenite ones, you know, about this long. Oh, yeah, what you have is shofar envy. Look at what I got. Look how many times I can toot it before I pass out. <laughs> or you go to a conference and they whip out their talites and it's, it's like they put on Superman's cape. And they about have the same mentality. Guys, I'm, I'm going to have to confess in my childhood. Before I went to kindergarten, my mommy got me a Superman suit. I put on that cape, and I was at my great aunt and uncles that were taking care of me, and there was a door that opened that went down a flight of stairs, and it ended on a brick wall because there was a door there, and you had to make a right or left to go into the basement. I put on that Superman cape, and I was about ready to jump down them stairs because I was going to go ahead and fly on down into the basement. <laughs> and they grabbed me right before I went, up, up, and away! I see the same attitude in a lot of the Messianic movement over this, and they miss the point. This whole garment, in fact, is supposed to be white because I've been washed. Even though my sins were as garlic, they shall be white as snow, white as wool, because of Messiah. This whole thing is about Messiah, and it's supposed to be a physical reminder of me to put on Messiah. It's not a Superman cape. It doesn't make me special. It can make me goofy if I do it wrong, just like anything else. Because the goal is what? Messiah. Jesus. Everything about this, it's to teach me something, teach me where I'm supposed to be, that the goal is Messiah and him alone. This doesn't make me more righteous. This serves as a physical reminder so that I can remind myself daily because I know me. If I don't have some physical reminders, I will stray. That's why we have the Sabbath every week. A man will work himself to death if God doesn't say, on this day you stop and remember me and stop from your labor. And we have men today that are not walking with God, that do not keep the Sabbath, that have worked themselves to death. The only reason I can work six days is because I'm in Messiah. I have rested in him. Say, Mike, why, why are you sharing all this? Because Jesus is the epicenter of everything. The minute Jesus is not the center of it, you have stopped functioning in the kingdom of God. And you begin dealing with the kingdoms of men. Now, I want to read out of Hebrews. Two places I want to read. Let's, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, 
lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, that any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as to, as to them, but the, word, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall enter, uh, they shall enter my wrath, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. But he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, so after a long time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, and harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. You need to underline verse 9 in your Bible. Therefore remaineth the people of God a new level of rest in Messiah that we've never yet experienced. Everything that God is doing and reestablishing Torah and everything else, it takes the pedagogy and the goal to get into that rest. It takes the, that's why in the book of Revelation, as it starts talking about the end time things that must come to pass, they sang the song of Moses, the pedagogy, and the goal, Messiah. Now, once I get into Messiah, I can turn to the Torah, and it now doesn't lead me to Messiah. It teaches me how to walk with Messiah. Isn't that good? Because when I do that, it gives me a rest. Now, in verse 10, for he that, that, that is entered into his rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest lest any man fall under the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful. That's the purpose of the word of God, is to teach us how to enter into that rest. You can't enter into the rest of God by being goobery or being mystical or being all these different things. You enter in by allowing the commandments of God to show you the need for Messiah and actually everything that earned, your, that earned our salvation through Messiah is prescribed in the Torah. That's the very law that he used to save your soul. Isn't it? You can't use a law to accomplish something, then do away with the very law that you used to do it, because if you did, you would do away with the very thing you accomplished because you pulled the foundation from it. But there is a rest that we have. And I'm not seeing a lot of rest right now in the body of Christ. Guys, with what's coming you have to learn how to function in supernatural rest. Because in the last days, the Antichrist will be given the power to wear out the saints, and if the saints don't know how to labor into that rest, they're in trouble. They are in trouble. Now with what's coming, I want to, I want to go to, uh, to Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 22. I love this. How many know that we are not coming to Mount Sinai, but unto Mount Zion when we deal with God? A little bit better place. Let's start up here at verse 22. But ye are coming to Mount Zion. That should be spelt with a Z, not an S. The King James Version did that because they tried to honor the priory of Sion, which was a Masonic lodge. Say, ugh. He's BZ. It's talking about Mount Zion, not some Masonic thing. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to who? Jesus, which is the goal, the mediator of the New Testament of the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Don't you like that? 
The blood of Jesus speaks better things than you. Can, can I just deal with that just for a second? Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Isn't that what Genesis tells us? That I even hear his blood crying out right now for vengeance. The blood of Jesus doesn't cry out for vengeance. In fact, years ago, there's only a few really what I call prophetic visions that, you, you know, there's just sometimes God can show you things, but there's something of an open vision that it's more real than this. The colors are brighter. It's, it's almost hard to, to, it's like being put into a 3D movie type of thing. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And I, I saw the blood of Jesus alive on the mercy seat of God, and it was speaking. And the Holy Spirit said, draw closer. And I began to hear what it said. Abel's blood was crying out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus says, I will have a people and they will be holy. I will have a people and they will be holy. How many know that's speaking better things than that of Abel? The blood of Jesus is crying out for the lost to be found. The blood of Jesus is crying out for sins to be forgiven. The blood of Jesus is looking for a wrong to right. And for us to be the redeem those that are called out to walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why that is so significant. See that ye not refuse him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that speaketh on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Who's speaking from heaven? J-E-S-U-S. -S. The Gentile church that has made a Greek philosophy way of finding Jesus has been refusing him who speaketh. They have chose to listen to another. But so have many. What not, this is one thing I, I have... I've talked to people like Dr. Marvin Wilson at Gordon College. I mean, he's, he's known for writing Our Father Abraham. And if you get into Jewish roots, that's one of the first books you pick up. I sat there and talked with him as tears ran down his face as he was talking about guys that went through his class that got so far into Judaism they renounced Messiah. That, you see, if you get into Torah, it's going to take you to Messiah. If you get into the wanderings, it's going to take you a wandering away from Messiah. And so we, we have two things going on. We have the Gentile church that the enemy is using to keep us away from the goal. And we have a, a, a portion of Judaism that's keeping us away from the very Messiah that they birthed. Because they came to the Jordan and they said no. But I, how many know that I, I am standing on the scripture that one day all their eyes are going to be open. And they're going to say, you know what? I'm back at the Jordan. It's time to cross on over. I now know who Jesus is. Oh, I can't wait for that day. But you know what's going to happen before they can do that? They've got to lay down the writings of all their wanderings and return back to Moses. Jesus said, you would not hear Moses because they began following oral Torah even back then. The beginnings of it, Jesus had a real problem with. He never corrected Torah, but he was constantly correcting oral Torah. Go back to Moses. Well, Mike, have you been praying that all the rabbis would find Jesus? The first, i, I got to get them to step one first. I've been praying that there would be a revival of Moses, that they would get so infatuated with Moses they would leave everything else alone. Just get with Moses. If you get with Moses, you're going to find Jesus. You get into the prophets and you're really honest with yourself, you're going to find the goal, Jesus. So we, we have the middle of the road where God has called us and we have got to make sure that in what we do, we're not refusing him that speaketh. I don't get to enter into his rest. And, and folks, we need to have that rest. But he goes on to warn us about some things here. 
Verse 25, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. If, we, if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth. How many know at Mount Sinai when God spoke, the whole mountain shook? It shook. It, it actually freaked out Moses. You know, I've been here before. It wasn't like this the first time I was here. <laughs> Whose voice then shook the earth, but now they have, he, he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Now, how many know there's more than one heaven? There's three. Not in Kabbalah that there's seven, there's three. There is the first heaven, which is our universe. The second heaven is a demilitarized zone where the enemy dwells. That's where principalities and powers, rulers of darkness sit. The third heaven is the throne of God. And God said, you know what? Jesus is getting ready to speak, and not only is he going to shake the earth, he's going to take that second heaven, he's getting ready to knock everybody out of their thrones. They have been perched up there for 6,000 years. They have declaimed themselves as gods and they have, they have worked mankind like little puppets on a string. They think they're Geppetto. And God is getting ready to say, I'm getting ready to rock your world, Jack. I'm going to show you who Almighty God is. Because you see, there's this third heaven that you're not allowed to function in. And that third heaven is over everything else. And Almighty God is going to get his foot to tapping because there's going to be a people that hear his voice and function in him. And he's going to start shaking there all the way down. Guys, we're on the, we're on the edge of a shaking a coming. How much so? Got to listen to Chaplain Lindsey Williams. How many know the elite has a, has a plan for the earth? They have a plan. And they, they are Babylon personified. That they control this planet. They control all the oil. They control all the stuff. And they have purposed that oil is going to be $150 a barrel. They have purposed for what they want, that gold has got to be $5,000 an ounce. And they have been systematically taking the planet that way. I, I have grown tired of hearing, well, we are dependent upon Middle East oil. The only reason we are is because they won't let us tap the biggest reserves on the planet, which are still in America. They won't let us tap into those. They know they're there. The largest oil reserve ever discovered in history is in Alaska. They discovered it and capped it off. There's ones in Montana, there are South Dakota, there's ones in the Rocky Mountains. We could actually tell the Middle East what they could do with their oil. But see, if that happened, then gasoline would be 65 cents a gallon. That won't work when you want to take over the earth. They want to collapse all the world's economies. Do you see it coming? And they want to go back to a gold standard, but for it to work because there's too many people and not enough gold, they got to raise it up to $5,000 an ounce. But what I got tickled about, okay, the elite are handing the Middle East over to the Muslim Brotherhood. They were the force behind the Arab Spring that our president so hailed. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Because they want to destabilize the Middle East to drive the prices of oil up before they can become our heroes. And then they're going to, of course, sell all this new oil at $150 a barrel because they really want you to pay $6 a gallon. But Gaddafi did not go quietly into the night. It took him a couple of more months. Syria was supposed to have already been... Syria was supposed to be under brotherhood control... Six months ago. <laughs> they're frustrated. They're anxious. They're worried because their plan is constantly being stifled by God. But you see, that it's not just Syria. They have got to topple Saudi Arabia. Because once you get these extremists in, ain't no oil flowing from the Middle East. All of a sudden, it's $150 a barrel. All the economies of the world will topple. And the only way to fix this is this needs to be one government, guys, you know. Just needs to be one currency because you got the 
dollar, you got the mark, you got the yen. You never know what it's going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to push the reset button. Everybody's poor except for a few. Everything goes back to the gold standard with the, with the new one world currency that's just as good as gold. Which means you go back to working for 50 cents an hour, even though you're making $20 an hour right now, because in the, in the scheme of things, that's actually what you're making and just don't know it. But God has been frustrating it. He has slowed down because, you see, they have an agenda, but God's got a plan. God saying, no, I, 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 I don't quite have what I need in place yet, so I'm going to frustrate the kings of this earth, and I'm going to go ahead and kick them into low gear. Won't you guys just crawl for a while to your consternation? It's not, you're not gods as you have supposed. You, 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 the, why do the heathens rage and, the, and they, they imagine this vain thing? God can put on the brakes any time he wants to because he says, I'm still trying to get the remnant in place. I'm still trying to get my people prepared. You see, I'm not praying that we, we, get, we can avoid the book of Revelation. I'm praying that I'm prepared when I go in, that I have what I need when I go in, that I'm out of debt when I go in, that I'm walking with Messiah the way that I'm supposed to when I go in, that I'm not playing church anymore, that I am the church of the living God, and that I am that remnant that hears his voice, and I move in his power, and I understand the power and the majesty of his commandments, and I understand the blood. There's a lot of messianics that can tell you the commandments, but they don't have a clue about the blood. They don't have a clue about the authority of the name of Jesus. They don't even understand binding and loosing. Now, they'll get one interpretation of binding and loosing, but they'll turn around and tell you there's five levels of interpretation of Torah. Maybe there's more than one level of interpretation of binding and loosing. Jesus was giving us the greater revelation. Why? Turn to your neighbor and say there's a shaking coming. Verse 27, and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of those things that are made, that those things that cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, oh, I, I get excited. Anytime in the word of God you see wherefore or therefore, I really, really, really get excited. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace. And when I find the goal of Messiah and stay in him and understand that that kingdom that Messiah brings, first those commandments bring you to Messiah, and then it teaches you how to walk in the kingdom of Messiah, and I stay centered in Messiah and his completed work, I am receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The elites Kingdoms are going to be shaken to the core when this thing is over. The principalities and powers are going to be shaken to the core when this thing is over. But because of Messiah, I am in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Woo! I've made myself happy. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom that can see it's it's present tense, it's continual tense. If I stay in Messiah, I keep on receiving. If I stay in Messiah every day, that, that's why I use all these things and I use the word to bring me closer and to receive more of the kingdom, to receive more of Messiah. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I count everything but dung except to know Christ. Because I got a taste of the kingdom. I got a taste of the real deal. And I, can, I consider graduating from the school of Hillel under Gamaliel, I consider my post on the Sanhedrin and all the awards and accolades that I have, I consider it as dung. Because I got a taste of the kingdom that's coming. You see, I'm a pusher. I'm pushing the kingdom. My job is to get you addicted to the kingdom. 
My job is to get you addicted to Jesus. You get up in the morning and you just got to have another taste. You got to have, you just got to come into his presence and to know him more because the more that you know, the more you grow. And the more you grow, the more you realize you need him. I'm trying to get past verse 28. (laughs) Wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby whereby we may serve. Uh Uh-oh. I thought I got grace so that I could do whatever I wanted to do. (laughs) I got grace so that I could serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. I was set free from Pharaoh so that I could serve the true God. That we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Oh, you see, when you start understanding the Torah, you start getting some godly fear. Because let me tell you something. Now, this is, this is hot off the press. God has about had enough. God has about had enough of this circus called planet Earth. He has about had enough of people that said they're following him, but they're doing everything but following him. And he has had enough of all these crazy people that have made up their own gods in their own image and have rejected him and say, we will serve this. He is tired of atheists that say that God does not exist while the whole time secretly they're trying to become gods. That that has been foolish to me. You're trying to become something that you deny exists. How's that for foolhardy? For our God is a consuming fire. Where are we headed? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You know what's going to take you through the fire? You better have the fourth man. You better be found in the fourth man. You see, I don't want him found in me. I want to be in his pocket. I, I don't want him to be found with me. I want to be found with him. I don't want people, well, Mike Lake, you know, Jesus is with them. I want them to look at Jesus and say, you know what, Mike Lake, you, you can't even get rid of Mike Lake. Mike Lake has moved into his back pocket and is saying, I have found home. Jesus moves, I just weave with him. We laugh about that, but we, where he leads me, I will follow, unless I don't like it. If he leads me, I will follow, unless it's too Jewish. If he leads me, I will follow, unless I've got to crucify my flesh. No, where he leads me, I will follow. Always. Always. When Jesus bobs and weaves, I, bo- I just want to be a shadow. I just, I just want to follow him. Wherever he goes, that's where I'm going. Whatever he's doing, that's what I want to do. I don't care what the world's doing. I don't care what the world says is popular. Because right now, going to hell is very popular. Creating theologies that p- placate the flesh are popular. I have found out the doctrines of God crucify the flesh. Do you know I'm here to kill you? On God's installment plan. I am here to hand you a nail and a hammer and say you better find the cross and you better learn how to start crucifying the flesh because if you don't, it will kill you. Either you kill it or it will kill you. Because there's a shaking coming. And everything not in Messiah is going to shake. You can walk in God's blessing in the midst of the tribulation period. You can be that bride without spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing in the tribulation period. You can move in authority in the tribulation period. It, but you better learn how to do it before it starts. Don't, be, don't, don't throw a guy that's never handled a gun, throw him in the midst of a war and say, now time to learn how to be a soldier. You better learn how to be a soldier before the war begins. God's calling you. And we've got to answer. The goal is who? 
The goal is Jesus. The goal is Jesus. The goal is Jesus. If you can't find Jesus as the center of it, don't be involved with it. It's either the musings of a Gentile or the wanderings of a Jew. I need to write that down. It's got to be Jesus. Well, Brother Mike, you're anti-Semitic. No, I am not. I'm saying both sides have really messed up and you better get back with Moses and you better get back with Jesus. Jesus was not the marginal Jew. Jesus was the perfect Jew. We've got to line up with him. Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus, Father, that we could hear your voice. Father, we choose to hear him who speaketh. Father, we believe this morning that by the finished work of Messiah at Calvary, that his blood has washed away every sin, that his spirit has come on the inside of us to empower us to walk in your kingdom and to walk in your commandments, that everything that is said and done, let it be done in the name of Jesus, representing his character and his nature. Father, give us the grace to get so established in that kingdom that nothing can take us out because only that kingdom will not be shaken. Father, let us be found in you in every single area of our lives, spirit, soul, and body, and give us the grace to do it so that we could serve you with a pure heart and with pure hands. We ask in Jesus' name.